Namaste, it's Sahara Rose, and welcome back to the Highest Self Podcast, a place where we discuss what makes you your soul's highest evolvement. Are you interested in having a career focused on health and wellness? Well, if so, then the universe is calling you to become a holistic health coach. I am offering this incredible deal, a discount of $1,500 off my alma mater, Institute for Integrative Nutrition, which is the world's largest nutrition school with guest teachers such as Deepak Chopra, Chris Carr, Dr. Hyman, and Dr. Andrew Whale, and so many others. It is split between six months of health coaching programs teaching you hundreds of nutritional theories, including Ayurveda, as well as six months of business coaching. And as an additional bonus, I am offering a webinar where I will teach you how to use social media to create a thriving career as a health coach. On top of that, I have created a private Facebook community just for the Highest Self podcast listeners who are becoming health coaches to connect with each other, meet up with each other, and support one another on this journey. So if you're interested, send an email over to Sahara, S-A-H-A-R-A at eatfeelfresh.com with subject I-I-N. Again, Sahara at eatfeelfresh.com with subject I-I-N. And I will personally send you back the email that will allow you to get a $1,500 off discount as well as my business coaching webinar and the private Facebook group. I'm so excited for you to begin your journey as a health coach. I am really excited to do this episode because it is a topic that I see so many people, especially spiritual people, need help with. And that is abundance. And I myself was one of those people that deeply needed help. I was someone who, and let me know if this sounds familiar, would walk around the store and look at the price tag before I would actually look at the clothing article. And then based off if I liked the price tag, I would then look at the clothes. So if I saw it was expensive, I wouldn't wouldn't even look at it. If it was cheap, I'm like, oh, okay, guess I'll take that. I was someone that would look at the menu of a restaurant and scroll my eyes down the prices and then the price that I liked, which was the lowest one. I would look at that, okay, I guess I'll order that. I was someone who would spend hours upon hours, though I didn't realize it, figuring out little ways to save money. You know, maybe if I eat a lot of samples of the mac and cheese, then I'll get full and I won't have to buy it for $5. Maybe if I bring my own packets of all this stuff to the coffee shop and mix it into the hot water because I get the hot water for free, then I could save money. And I'm not saying any of these these things were bad, especially when I was, you know, a college student and, you know, wasn't really making much money at all, like completely broke. Those things were helpful and they were holding me back from the big picture. Would you rather spend an hour a day focused on how you can save five, 10, 20, 50, maybe a hundred dollars. Seems like a good thing to spend your hour on, right? I saved $20. Or would you rather spend an hour a day focused on how you can make multiple six, seven figures, hundreds of thousands of dollars? See, if right now you kind of felt a little uncomfortable, hundreds of thousands of dollars, this is so inaccessible. What is she saying? Only rich people make that kind of money. Notice that because that is your money block right there. In this episode, I really want to share with you that there are no such thing as rich people, poor people. It's all a mindset because you can have all of the zeros upon zeros in the bank with a number in front. So it's a good thing, but you could have all of them millions and still have a scarcity mindset. And you could have very little money, just enough for your basic needs and have an abundance mindset. So it doesn't have so much to do with the actual money, but it has to do with your relationship with it. So recently in Rose Gold Goddesses, and this is my membership community, rosegoldgoddesses.com. You can find the link in the show notes. But 
each month we work with a different goddess energy. And October was all about Lakshmi, the goddess of abundance. So I really dove deep into this topic. It's also a topic that I've taught extensively on. I have taught abundance mindset masterclasses and programs and like this is my jam. I have seven planets in Capricorn, so I really like talking about money. And it's something I realized on the podcast for the past like two years. I think I haven't done a money podcast and wow, is it more needed than ever. So I've noticed that a lot of spiritual people, especially, have really negative relationships with money because we've, we've taken on this false belief that if you're spiritual or if you are doing something that's helping people, you shouldn't charge. Have you ever thought or heard a friend say, well, if they were a real healer, they wouldn't charge that much or they would do it for free. Healing should be for free, right? Haven't we heard people say this before? Do you ever go to your doctor or your insurance company and say, you know what? My doctor is healing me, so it should be free. Do you go to your therapist like, you know what? It seems like you're really enjoying this. So because you're enjoying this, you should do it for free. And it's, it's helping me, so it should definitely be double free. Would you go to anyone, your hairdresser, your plumber, anyone that is giving you their time and expect them to do it for free? No. Then why do we think someone who is using their time in the most valuable way to heal us should do it for free? Let me tell you where this belief comes from because I've done a lot of deep digging around it. It comes from history. It comes from the fact that traditionally the healers in society, whether they were the monks or the nuns or the shamans, were taken care of by the village. You know, I used to live in a temple in Thailand when I was doing volunteer work there. And every single day we would make food and bring it to the temple and, and feed the monks. And the monks didn't work. They weren't doing the construction work we were. They weren't in the rice fields working where we were. They were in the temple meditating and we would do the work and bring them food. So there was this, there was this balance of they were holding a spiritual vibration and we were doing the physical work to support them. So historically, spiritual people, healers, etc., had everything taken care of by their village. So therefore there was no charge for it. And also there wasn't really money back then. It was a barter system. So their barter, and this still happens in India all the time, the pundit comes over and you barter them something. You give them coins, you give them flowers, you give them something back. You don't have someone come and bless your house and be like, okay, bye, you're a healer. You should do this shit for free. If, if you want something back, you're fake. Like, no, this is the craziest thing I have ever fucking heard. And no one who is a healer would ever think that. The only people who are saying that if you're a real healer, you would do it for free are not healers. But many of you who are listening, who are the healers, are afraid of charging and that is why you're not doing this shit full time. I'm going to be real. Your fear of charging, your fear of asking for what you are worth is keeping you from doing your dharma. Because we think we are being all altruistic by doing it for free and not charging anyone. Sure, come over, I'll do Reiki for you and then I'll massage your feet. I'll make you a bubble bath and talk about your problems for 10 hours for free because I'm a healer and that's what I do. Guess what? After your first client, you will never want to do that again because you're going to be like, wow, it is draining to be a healer. I've given so much of my energy back and, and I did it for free. I'm not doing that again. Also, I don't have time to spend all of my weekends doing all of these healings for people. I'm working during the week. So during the weekends, I want to do something to fill up my cup. So this is why so many People who seek to be healers, they don't want to charge. They do it part-time. They don't charge for it. End up not doing it full-time. So really, you are doing yourself a disservice because you're not living your dharma. You're going to have to make money some way. So you're going to do that thing that you don't want to do that is not healing the world, that you're simply just doing for money because you need it, because the world where we live in a currency-based society or you can realize that your healing has value. 
You can even think bigger than one-on-one. You could think, how can I do a group healing? How can I teach this online? How can I put this in a book, on a podcast, in a program, in a certificate? You think bigger, you think bigger, and you serve more people. So an abundance mindset, as you can see, is not just about money. It's your abundance of energy. People who are abundant realize that there is possibility in everything. They know that the more that they give, the more that they will receive. They know by stepping up, maybe spending a lot more than they feel comfortable with in something that is in alignment with their truth. I'm not saying max out your credit cards on Christian Louboutins, but in a mentorship program, a mastermind program, these are all things that I've spent money that scared the shit out of me on and ended up making me such a bigger, such a more expansive person. And the amount of money that I was so afraid of spending, like for example, when I was 23 years old, I had no money at all. I was doing some health coaching clients online, but my parents had completely cut me off because I was going on my alternative path living in India and Bali. And I also couldn't really leave India and Bali because the rent was so cheap there. In India, I was spending $3 a night on rent, living in a hut on the beach in Goa. And in Bali, I lived with a Balinese family that I was doing like bartering for, like helping them and taking care of their village. And then I moved to the city Ubud where I was paying like $10, $12 a night. So I was like never had more than $200 at a time. And I was, you know, in my, in my twenties and I had all of the money mindset issues. I grew up with a dad who was very strict around money, lots of rules around it. For example, one of my oldest memories of money, the first time I remember even thinking about money was being a kid. And I was at the ice cream store with my brother and normally my mom would bring us, but this time it was my dad bringing us. And I always got the vanilla with sprinkles. That was my jam. And my brother loved the chocolate. I didn't like chocolate ice cream. He didn't like vanilla with sprinkles. So this time we went with my dad and my dad was like, okay, pick a flavor. We sat our flavors. He says, no, 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 you guys pick one because if you get a medium, you'll save 67 cents than if we get too small. So you guys have to pick one. We're like, huh? So I'm like, okay, so we're going to get the vanilla, right? He's like, no, 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 we're going to get the chocolate. I'm like, no, we're going to get the vanilla, chocolate, the vanilla, chocolate. My dad gets his coffee ice cream. He's like, oh, you didn't decide? We're going. Neither of us got the ice cream. And I learned probably five years old that the person who has money gets to make the decisions. And the fact that I didn't have the money, the fact that it was too much for me to get the thing that I want means that I have to figure out a way to be that person who has that control, who's able to make the decisions in my life. Otherwise, I'm going to end up empty handed. So I want you to go back and, and maybe you put a pause on this. Maybe you think about this at the end of the episode, but what is your first memory of money? When is the first time money even came up? What, what were you taught about money as a child? Was it more money, more problems? Was it money doesn't grow on trees? Was it people with money are greedy? Was it, oh, we don't have enough money for that. Everything you wanted, we don't have enough money for that. I'm not made of money. What did you hear around money as a child? Because as kids, we are creating our worldview. In fact, most of our personality is created by the time we are like five years old. So our earliest memories with money will create that, that offset, that vibration that we end up living our lives around until we do the money mindset work. So you may have grown up learning that more money, more problems, right? So because of that, you're constantly thinking, well, I don't want to make any money because I'm going to have more problems and my life is going to be difficult and I don't want a difficult life. So if I stay in this box where I'm not making too much money, then I'll be safe. Or maybe it's money is the root of all evil. Well, I don't want to be evil. So why would I want to get more money? Because it's the root of all evil. Maybe it's we can't afford it. I'm a person who can't afford the things that I want. Therefore, I'm unworthy. I'm unworthy of money. I'm unworthy of the things that I want. 
So I want you to really deep dive journal about this. When is the first time that money came up for you and what was that vibration? And then you can go deeper. What was your mother's relationship with money like? What was your father's relationship with money? Whose traits have you picked up on? Whose traits have you rebelled against? Oftentimes we mirror a money relationship of one of our parents and reject another. And oftentimes in relationships, we attract the opposite. So someone who is more like frugal and saving will often marry someone who's a big spender. So for example, in my marriage, I am actually the more frugal one. I'm like the one who's like checking my bank statement and making sure everything's right. And in a way, it serves me because I, I don't overspend at all. Like I wear the same clothes every single day. I don't shop. I mean, I definitely buy things on Amazon, but like I will return the things that I don't use. Like I'm that type of person. Whereas my husband will like order Postmates every day and order all the stuff and like not use it, forget about it. And in a way it's beautiful. Like he's really abundant with it. And also it can drive me a bit crazy because I'm very aware of waste. And that to me, I'm like, oh my gosh. So oftentimes in relationships, we attract that opposite partner. So who are you in your relationship? What is your partner like? What does it bring up for you? So our beliefs about money are essentially creating our bank account. If you believe that you are worthy of money, that money comes easily to you, that even if you spend money, if, as long as you're spending it in the right way, it's going to come back to you, that is what's going to show up. If you believe there's never enough money, that you can't spend money on things that are important to you, then that's what's going to show up. So it's important for us to become aware of our abundance mindset because if you're listening to this, you are someone who is here to uplift the vibration of the planet. You're someone who's here to serve. But we limit our serving when we are so afraid of investing in ourselves. For example, I was always someone who was very good at figuring things out on my own. So I wouldn't hire anyone. I wouldn't get a coach. I wouldn't do anything because I felt like I could just Google it and I could figure it out. And guess what? There are a lot of things I figured out and there were a lot of things that took me way too much time, wasted honestly years of my life. And one of my biggest regrets in terms of my business is not hiring earlier. Like actually it wasn't even until last year that I hired someone. Because before then, I was wearing that, I can do it all on my own hat. And that hat is a hat that a lot of women wear. It's a hat that the patriarchy puts on us. That, oh, women who hire are not capable. Oh, you can't clean your house on your own? Oh, you can't full-time take care of your kids on your own and have a career and have a rockin' body and have a yoga practice and this and this and that? So. The society makes us feel like we are unworthy if we have to outsource, we have to hire, even though a man who does it is a boss. Oh, yo, he's a boss. He has all these people working for him. He's just laying back in his office. Goals, a woman doing it. Oh, she's a bitch. Oh, she's a materialist. She's so masculine. Have you guys ever thought that? I used to think that you had to choose between love and career as a woman. You either had a loving relationship, a husband that adores you and supported you, or you were a career woman who went after what she wanted and no one would ever love you or weak men only would love you and you would have to be the provider and wear the pants in the relationship and it would really suck. All the movies I watched reframed that belief. My family reframed that belief. How many of you guys are still reframing that belief today? So we don't realize how much this holds us back until we look around us and we're like, wait, how are all of these people having these six-figure launches and transformations and seven-figure businesses and empires? How are they doing it? And I'm still year after year stuck here, barely able to pay my tax at the end of the year. That is a reflection of your beliefs. You shift your beliefs, you shift your actions, you shift your actions, you shift your reality. So, so many of us, we get stuck on the external. Well, if I work more hours doing the same thing, then I'll make more money. Instead of how can I offer more value? How can I come up with something that 
will take me even farther. You know, let's say you work at a carpet store. I don't know. (laughs) You work at a carpet store, you're paid minimum wage and you're like, oh, I never have enough money to pay for my rent. This is so stressful. So you keep taking more and more and more hours. Instead of looking around that carpet store, that carpet store, and seeing, okay, well, maybe if we rearrange things, the owner would make more money, and maybe we should do a rebrand here, and maybe we should go on social media, and have we sent email lists out recently, and what about doing a sale like this, and what about teaming up with that business over there and doing something together? You start coming up with these ideas. Suddenly that boss is not going to keep you at that minimum wage job on the floor. He's going to be like, hello, we need you executing these ideas. So suddenly those same hours you were working, you're getting paid double, triple, quadruple, 10 times the amount simply by changing your mindset. We live in this false belief, this maya, this illusion that money is over there and I'm over here. There's like this invisible wall around me and money and somehow I can't get to it. That's for rich people. Not realizing that that rich person did something to get that money. And yes, there is like passed on wealth intergenerationally. That definitely exists. But the truth is, and this is statistically shown, that most of the time people who had very rich grandparents end up not being wealthy themselves because they weren't taught the value of money. They weren't taught the appreciation and the resilience and how to use and how to create a business that even if they were born into all this wealth, if they're not taught that, they end up losing it. So intergenerational wealth actually doesn't really last that long. And now so many of the world's billionaires are choosing not to give their children that money because they want their children to learn to make it on their own. And there are more self-made millionaires and billionaires at this time than ever before. So we need to get out of that framework that... Only certain people have money. A certain type of person has money because that is exactly the belief that is holding us back. There's no certain type of person that has money except for the type of person who believes they're worthy of money. That's it. And you can choose that to be you. And once you make that decision, you start thinking bigger. You make bigger choices. You make bigger decisions, bigger investments. You show up in bigger ways. And that leads to a bigger bank account. So let's let go of this belief that I have to struggle to make money, that money is so much hard work and I can't do it. I don't want to be bothered. I don't want to live my life and be a slave of that whole money thing. Guess what? The people who are thinking the most about money are the people who don't have it. Because when you don't have money, it is constantly on your mind. It is constantly, okay, well, is that on sale? Well, should I get two of these? Because if I buy two, I get to save money on this. And okay, well, I'm going to wait until February 8th to get that because it's going to go on the sale. And oh, I forgot the code. I didn't use the code. Okay, I need to get a refund and go back and use the code this time so I can get the money back. And oh my God, my Postmate order. Well, at least the Postmate order is wrong so I can get my money back. Anyone? (laughs) I mean, I know all of these things beliefs and thoughts because I've had them. I can't make this shit up. I'm reading your mind because I've been there. I've been there and I've transformed my mindset, which literally led to me going within one year when I was under the poverty line, having written a book, by the way, I'll share more of that in my mastermind, but writing a book is not necessarily the solution to your problems either. It's learning to create a business. But I went from in one year from like under poverty line Obamacare to making what a professional would make in the U.S. to multiple six figures to seven figures. So that was within four years from seven figures to below $13,000 within four years. And what changed? My mindset. You could say, oh, well, you know, you're famous. You have a podcast, you have a book. So it's easy for you to say. No, I know a lot of people with millions of Instagram followers who have full-time jobs because they haven't figured out how to create a business. So it has nothing to do with that. It has everything to do with your money mindset. I know people who are not on social media at all have or have very small followings who are making multiple seven figures. 
So again, notice what your limiting beliefs are. Oh, only famous people have money. Oh, only if you're a good speaker, will you have money? Only if you're a good singer, whatever your thing is, you got to be masculine, this, that, that is your limiting belief that you get to work with, that you get to reframe and you get to find expansion within. And once you can take that limiting belief and realize that it's bullshit and it's holding you back and that you are just as worthy of abundance as anyone else, that is when the magic happens. So we are going to be diving deep into creating your conscious empire, money mindset, taking your message to the next level, finding your voice, books, podcasts, speaking engagements, certificate programs, signature events, facilitator trainings, all of this stuff. And this is not for everyone. This mastermind, together we impress mastermind, co-facilitated by me, Sarah Pendrick and Jenna phillips Ballard, is not for everyone. It is for a woman who is already in a successful career. She is someone who has overcome a good amount of these money mindset blocks, but she's ready to go the next level. She's ready to create her empire, her business that is based off of her as a person and not having to work for someone else. So if this is you, or if you're curious about learning more, it is application only because we are really creating a community of women who are ready to support, inspire, and uplift each other to the next level because it's a mastermind. And if you guys don't know what masterminds are, it's actually a curated group of individuals that work together, strategize with each other, talk about their business blocks and their goals and their and their dreams and their visions and what's happening. And they support each other with the help of us, your facilitators, to take you to the next level. So it's To me, it's been the most transformative thing because you get not only the opinion of your coaches, but of all of the people who are going to be in the mastermind. So if you're interested, you're curious, you want to dive deeper, head over to togetherweempress.com. Again, that is togetherweempress.com. And I am so excited to see you there. If you love this episode, I would love if you could leave me a review in the iTunes store. And as a free gift, I will share with you the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. Simply email a screenshot of your review over to sahara at eatfeelfresh.com. Again, sahara, S-A-H-A-R-A at eatfeelfresh.com. And I will send you over the first half of my unreleased book, Eat Right for Your Mind Body Type. Thank you and namaste. Namaste.